Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Dr. T. Vijay Kumar. I'm a professor of English at Usmania University, Hyderabad. This module is on Chinua Achebe and his classic novel, Things Fall Apart. This is from the paper, African and Caribbean Writing in English. Since this is a very important novel, we are going to cover this novel in two modules. In this module, we will be talking about the broader context in which things fall apart can be understood. By the end of the module, you will get an idea about the larger significance of things fall apart as a novel and its place in the overall context of African literature as a whole. Chinua Achebe is an African writer. More specifically, he's a Nigerian writer. Although he has written short stories, novels, critical essays, and poetry, he is best known for his novels and also to some extent for his critical essays. Achebe has written five novels. The first one being Things Fall Apart, published in 1958. His second novel was a novel called No Longer at Ease. This was published in 1960, followed by the third novel, Arrow of God, published in 1964. His fourth novel, A Man of the People, was published in 1966. And then there was a 20-year gap between his fourth novel and the fifth novel. His fifth novel was titled Ant Hills of the Savannah, published in 1987. Things Fall Apart, as I said, was published in 1958, that is, two years before Nigeria became independent in 1960. Things Fall Apart is not the first novel written by an African writer, but it is definitely one of the most widely read novels from Africa, and it is easily the novel which put the entire continent of, of Africa on the literary map of the world. It has sold more than 12 million copies, and it has been translated into more than 50 languages worldwide. But the significance of Things Fall Apart as a novel is not because of the number of copies it sold or the number of languages into which it has been translated. More importantly, Things Fall Apart is a foundational text. What I mean by that is that it is a novel which laid the foundation for African writing to be recognized globally and a kind of a beginning of a tradition uh, of African writing in English. And the importance of Things Fall Apart as a text is not just because it's a wonderful story and not just because Achebe is a great storyteller and a master craftsman, but the real significance of Things Fall Apart as a novel can be understood if we read the novel against the background and in the larger context of the way in which Africa has been represented in European writing. For example, if I say Africa, just think about five images that come to your mind. And then sit down and see if any of those images is a positive image of Africa. You know, the first thing that comes to our mind when we say Africa is that it is a dark continent, poverty ridden, you know, savage people, barbarians, right, cannibals, and so on and so forth. Why do you think this, these images come to our mind whenever we say Africa? And even today, when is the last time that you ever heard or read any positive story in the media about Africa. Most of the time, whenever we hear about Africa, it is some disaster or some catastrophe that takes place in Africa. But there is a long tradition to this image of Africa, which is always projected as you know, the, an uncivilized place or a, a, a mysterious place which is difficult to understand and sometimes, you know, a place which is very dangerous. And 
this is not today's image of Africa. This is an image of Africa that goes back to nearly 16th century. So there is a long, nearly 400 years of creating an image of Africa in the Western media and the Western discourse. So when we look at uh, a text like Things Fall Apart, Things Fall Apart was in a way countering these 400 or more years of the representation of Africa in European writing and European culture. Because please remember that the image of Africa is not created only through literature, only through writing. Take cartoons, take films, you know, which, which uh, represent Africa. And most of the time, it is the same similar image of Africa that emerges from this wide range of texts. There is, just to give you a quick historical backdrop, Africa was in a way discovered by Europe in the 15th century. And soon after started the transatlantic slave trade. And one of the earliest books in English to refer to Africa was the translation of an ancient Greek text, which perhaps belongs to about second or third century. This was translated in the 16th century, in 1566 to be precise, under the title um, Ethiopian history. And this was translated into English by Thomas Underdown. So Thomas Underdown's The Ethiopian History was one of the earliest books, full-length books, to refer to Africa. And this was published in 1566. And then you would also remember that there are any number of references to African characters in Shakespeare's plays, like Othello, for example, or The Tempest, or Titus Andronicus. So there are several references to Africa going back to the 16th century. And from there onwards, you know, there, is, there have been any number of texts in Western writing which refer to Africa. In a way, the scramble for Africa, what, what we mean by the scramble for Africa is that most European powers wanted a piece of Africa uh, for in the 19th century. And Africa was divided among the European nations after the Berlin Conference in 1884. So the high point of European colonialism uh, in Africa is about uh, from the late 19th century. Just to give you an idea, in 1870, only 10% of Africa was under European rule. But by 1914, 90% of Africa came under European colonial rule. So that shows the extent of the colonial presence in Africa. Now, if we look at the image of Africa in this 400 to 400 and odd years of Western discourse about uh, Africa, there are certain common images of Africa. And this image of Africa was studied by two social scientists called Dorothy Hammond and Alta Jablo. They studied how Africa has been represented in Western discourse in over 400 years. And they published two books. One was called The Myth of Africa, which was published in 1977, and an earlier book called The Africa That Never Was, published in 1970. To summarize their findings, Dorothy Hammond and Alta Jablo identify two major myths about Africa, which were created, which were manufactured by colonial discourse. These two images, I can call them racial images of Africa and spatial images of Africa. What I mean by that is how African people have been represented in European writing and how Africa as a place has been represented in European writing. If we take the first myth or the first uh, image of Africans as a people, 
Dorothy Hammond and Alta Jablo identify two, uh, uh, there's a kind of a dichotomy about representing the African as a character. And this is, the African character is either presented as a beastly savage or as a noble savage. Of course, the common factor is that it is still a savage, but either as a noble savage or as a beastly savage. And as a noble savage, the African character becomes, you know, uh, you know, he's represented as a handsome, brave, self-confident, very aristocratic, and becomes an object of exaggerated admiration, you know, or, or, or uh, praise. On the other hand, the African is also presented as a beastly savage, cannibalistic, savage, you know, uncivilized, and, you know, as, as the title suggests, a beast. So this is as far as representing the African as a human being, either as a beastly savage or as a noble savage. Then the second kind of myths are about Africa as a place. Once again, there is a dichotomy. Africa is presented either as a white man's grave or as a white man's paradise. As a white man's grave, Africa becomes a place of disease, danger, dysentery, and death. You know, Africa becomes a dangerous place where, you know, people end up either losing their sanity or just dying. On the other hand, Africa is also you know, represented in popular imagination, you know, in, in films like the African Safari or the African Hatari, Africa is presented as a kind of uh, a hunter's paradise, you know, a place of exotic flora and fauna, you know, a place where you have, you know, great natural beauty and so on. So Africa as a place is presented either as a white man's grave or as a white man's paradise. These are what I would call the spatial myths, that is, Africa as a place. In the earlier, which was representing African as a character, were, were the racial myths. So these are the two major sets of myths that were manufactured in European writing spreading over 400 years. And these were the images that were identified by Alta Jablo and Dorothy Hammond. So one must remember that when Achebe was writing, he was writing against these long and lasting tradition of how Africa has been represented in European writing. More recently, interestingly, Africa becomes also a place which is used by the Western writers to test the character of a civilized Western man, usually. That is, Africa becomes a kind of a testing ground for Western characters. What happens very often in these novels is that a very normal, a very sane, a very civilized European goes to Africa, loses his sanity, loses his morality, loses his civilization and slips into some kind of a savagery. You have a number of novels, you know, Graham Greene's novels, and of course the most famous example is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, where a very civilized individual, you know, ends up in Africa and becomes a savage himself. So Africa is used as a kind of a testing ground. That is, if you survive Africa, you can survive you know, the whole world. That is, Africa is used as a place where, you know, civilization just disappears. So this is a kind of a more recent trend of using Africa as a testing ground for Western character. So these are the kinds of, you know, uh, mindsets against which Achebe published his first novel in 1958. Although Achebe could ignore several writings, several books which were set in Africa because they were all very popular books and very, you know, non-serious books. 
But Achebe was in a way provoked into writing this novel when Conrad's Heart of Darkness was hailed as one of the half dozen short novels, you know, the best ever, you know, short novels ever written in the English language. So when Conrad's Heart of Darkness was hailed thus, Achebe was provoked to take a closer look at Conrad's ideology and Conrad's view of Africa in this very famous novel, Heart of Darkness. In, as you know, Heart of Darkness was published in 1899. And it was, you know, as I said, recognized as one of the greatest short novels in the English language. And Achebe wrote, of course, he first gave that as a lecture at Massachusetts and later published it as an essay titled An Image of Africa, Conrad's Racism in Heart of Darkness which was, as I said, first a lecture and later published. This was in 1975. And in that essay, Achebe takes a close look at the ideology of Conrad and examines how Africa is represented in Conrad's famous novel. And Achebe concludes that Conrad was a thoroughgoing racist. Because Achebe accuses Conrad of two major crimes, as it were. One was his accusation that Conrad deprives Africa of history. That is, he represents Africa as if it has no history at all. Secondly, Conrad, according to Achebe, deprives the African character language. That is, he does not allow the African character to represent himself. So by denying history and denying language, according to Achebe, Conrad represents Africa merely as an object rather than as a subject. So this is the kind of, uh, because for Achebe, Conrad is a very important writer and he himself was deeply, I would say, influenced by Conrad. But when he looks closely at Conrad's Heart of Darkness, he finds the underlying racism in that book. And for Achebe, Conrad's Heart of Darkness becomes a representative Western text about Africa. And so that is the second context in which we have to look at things fall apart. That is, one, things fall apart is representing Africa against the dominant image of Africa, which emerges from nearly 400 years of Western writing about Africa. The second is more specifically about how Africa is represented in Conrad's Heart of Darkness and how Achebe seeks to counter that image through his novel, Things Fall Apart. The third component of the context in which the larger significance of things fall apart can be understood is how Achebe defines the role of a writer in a society. Achebe does not see art as a pure entertainment. In fact, for him, you know, the European dictum of art for art's sake is a complete nonsense because he firmly believes that art has a social responsibility and the writer has a social role and that of a teacher. In his famous essay, Novelist as a Teacher, which was collected in his collection of essays called Morning Yet on Creation Day, published in 1975, Achebe outlines what he sees as his role as a writer. According to Achebe, a writer in a society like Nigeria or Africa has two responsibilities. One, to teach the Western reader that civilization is not something which the Africans heard for the first time only from the Europeans. 
The second, more importantly for Echebe, is to educate African readers themselves who have internalized this you know, ideology about Africa being uh, a place without history, without civilization, and without culture. Because for Achebe, you know, his role as a teacher is defined by these two objectives. One, to educate an outside reader, but more importantly, to educate the readers at home. Because ultimately, you know, he says that he would be very happy if his novel gives the African reader the self-confidence back. Because through this novel, what Achebe is trying to you know, convey to the African reader is that Africa had its own traditions, Africa had its own culture, and Africa had its own history. It may be a very different kind of a history from Western history, but civilization or culture is certainly not something which the white man brought from outside. So these are the twin objectives with which Achebe wrote his Things Fall Apart. After analyzing Conrad's Heart of Darkness and the injustice of colonial representation of Africa, and after outlining his own approach to writing fiction in this famous essay, The Novelist as a Teacher, what emerges is a worldview that Achebe follows not only in Things Fall Apart, but in all his writing. So what is this worldview which we can observe in Achebe's writing? Achebe writes as a critical insider. That is, he is not a blind follower of tradition. At the same time, he does not just reject everything that is associated with colonialism or with Europe or Western uh, ideas. He writes with the conviction that all cultures have something to learn from others. And when two cultures come into contact with each other, they have an opportunity to learn the best from each other. But unfortunately, according to Achebe, colonialism interrupted this kind of a dialogue between cultures. Because what happened during colonialism is that Western culture, Western values, and Western civilization have been imposed on Africa as the only valid culture or civilization. And this, according to Achebe, interrupted the natural evolutionary process of African cultures and African societies. That is, every culture follows its own pace and its own pattern of evolution. And colonialism has interrupted that evolutionary process of African society and imposed its own alien values. But as I said, Achebe of course, is critical of both tradition as well as modernity. Because unfortunately, under colonialism, modernity came piggy riding colonialism. That is, modernism is never simply modernism as it was understood in Europe, but in the colonies, modernity became equated with colonial modernity. And therefore, you know, looking at and taking a close look at both tradition and modernity is something that Achebe does in all his writing and particularly in Things Fall Apart. So, in order to do that, Achebe adopts a Western genre like the novel because the novel as a genre is associated with Western culture. And there has been a long debate about whether African writers should use the novel as a form of writing. Because novel as a Western genre, many argued, it does not suit the, West, the, the African culture and African civilization. The second aspect of Westernization or Western culture that Achebe adopts is the English language. Once again, there have been very many debates in Africa about whether African writers should or should not use the English language because it's a colonial language. And yet, in order to establish a dialogue between the past and the present, between the alien culture and the indigenous traditions, Achebe adopts a dialogue approach. That is, he creates a dialogue 
between the indigenous traditions of Africa and the alien traditions brought by or introduced by colonialism. And in order to create that dialogue, in order to begin that dialogue, Achebe adopts two Western forms, that is, the novel as a genre and the English language you know, as a medium of communication. And without stretching the limits of either the novel as a genre or English as a language, he still establishes the validity of Africa as a culture. So to quickly summarize, what we have discussed so far is the broader context in which a novel like Things Fall Apart can be understood. The broader context comprises three components. One, the long and lasting tradition of colonial representation of Africa, that is, how Africa has been represented in Western discourse. And the second component is how, in a classic novel like Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Africa is represented as without history and without the ability to represent itself. The third component of this broader context is how Achebe defines his own role as a writer, as an intellectual in a society like Nigeria or Africa. As far as Achebe is concerned, he defines his role as a teacher in his famous essay, The Novelist as a Teacher. So these are the three components of the larger context in which the significance of a novel like Things Fall Apart, published in 1958, can be understood. Of course, we can enjoy the novel as a novel, we can enjoy the story, we can appreciate Achebe as a novelist, as a master craftsman, but Achebe's Things Fall Apart has a much, much larger significance. And that larger significance can be understood only when we read this novel in the larger context of the three components that I mentioned. We will look at Things Fall Apart as a novel, as a text itself in another module. Thank you.